So, now, how's this all happening? Well, here's one of the reasons, and this is what Booker and I were talking about earlier, is the effect of the WTO. And this particular uh, agreement, 1994, the TBT agreement, as it's known, Technical Barriers to Trade, the Agreement on Technical Barriers to Trade, is a fascinating document. Nerd, you might say. <laughs> But what it says is, I hereby declare that the EU is redundant. <laughs> because what it does is it says, if an international organization makes a standard for the purposes of facilitating trade, all the contracting parties of which the EU is one must adopt it. And it's not voluntary, it's mandatory. Shall, says the agreement. So that now the whole of the lawmaking and standard making apparatus has gone up a stage and it's made the whole of the single market mechanism within Brussels redundant. They're no longer in control. They're not making the laws, they're simply branding them and they become the middleman. We don't need them, the EU is irrelevant, we need to be at the top tables and they ain't in Brussels. So what do we do? This is the final cover for the European relationship, the next stage. It's happening. Gradually we detach the acquis from the EU. It's happening. More and more and more. This year we see this wonderful thing that none of you have ever heard of. Regulation Zero. They call it Regulation Zero. It's the first regulation to switch total vehicle type approval from Brussels to Geneva. Now you can approve a vehicle in Geneva under the Geneva UNIS rules, and you can sell it anywhere in the world except, of course, America, which is the great land of the free and the brave and free trade. Uh, yeah, fine. <laughs> Before that came tyres and the Global Tyre Agreement. Believe it or not, tyres is big billions of business. You can get a single standard on tyres, you're motoring. Who blocked it? <laughs> United States. However, it's happening. Detach the Aki. Stage one. Next stage. Build up Eunice. Now go back to the Hague speech in 1947, the year before I was born. Churchill talked about a hierarchy of states with a United Nations and a hierarchy of regional bodies. Eunice is the regional body, an intergovernmental body which agrees standards which we can all adhere to. But intergovernmental, not supranational. So that when you're looking for a replacement, you're looking at Eunice. It exists, it exists, and has done since 1946. 46? Yeah, 46. And what do you do then? Well, we all hated the EEA anyway, so we abolish it. We get rid of it. And actually, we end up with what Delors promised in 1992, but then changed his mind after the fall of the Berlin Wall and started dealing with the realities there, is we have a community of equals. So that everybody comes under the umbrella as equals in the enterprise of creating proper free trade, and that's what the new system looks like. Global standards, UNIS, EFTA, EFTA plus, because UK has joined it, and perhaps some others, through with the EU, equal with the non-aligned states. Under the umbrella of UNIS, if the EU wants its own little corner, then it's welcome, as long as we're not part of it, and we are equal in the decision-making as to what governs the single market. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the end game 
as far as Europe goes. Okay? So it ain't EEA. It ain't the Norway option. It's a genuine single market building on what already exists. Alrighty. Let's move to four, and we can now start this dealing with these quite speedily. As far as policy goes, hundreds of policy areas are determined by Brussels. That means that once we leave, we're going to have to rebuild all these policies. And there's loads of them. Here's just a short list. You know, you've got things like foreign defence policy, got to be rebuilt. We've got to start thinking in terms of what is in the national interest. You've got to, to rebuild agriculture. That is going to take a long time, ladies and gentlemen. Extraordinarily complex. But the first thing we're going to do is get rid of an agricultural policy. Because the big problem with the CAP is the A. Why take out a tiny bit of the rural economy and give it special, distorted, preferential treatment when, in fact, farming is part of the bigger rural economy and depends upon it. We don't want an agricultural policy. What we want is an integrated rural policy, which actually brings farming back and properly integrates it into the rural economy so that it works properly as a whole and not as a fragmented, distorted mess that it is at the moment. We look at things like fisheries, and then John's here from Restore Britain's Fish now, <laughs> uh, formerly Save Britain's Fish. And yes, as I said earlier, it, ta it will take years to develop, redevelop an effective policy. And it ain't going to happen immediately because, of course, we will see that the existing foreign fisheries um, uh, have actually acquired rights which we're either going to have to change over a period or buy them out. We cannot instantly kick out the Spanish fishermen or the Dutch fishermen for that matter. It's going to take time. Environmental policies are biggie, and of course that's global. Climate change, terribly global. And of course, digital market, which is mega, 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 mega. Brussels have made such a mess of it. But by and large, it's uh, intergovernmental and commercial. That then brings us to the world. We've done Europe, we now have to look at the world. And I did mention briefly, it now costs more in terms of international trading to trade in goods and to an extent services than it did before GATT. We've had this monumental effort to get rid of tariffs. But what's happened is the system has closed in on itself and created what are called non-tariff barriers. And recently we saw a fascinating document from the British Embassy in uh, Washington, which remarked that between the United States and Europe, the EU, Tariffs, which are high on automotive products, averaged out at 8.5%. But non-tariff barriers were the equivalent of 22.5% tariff equivalent. So that's actually an increased cost from the start of GATT. And this is happening worldwide. And it's actually damaging hugely global trade and global prosperity. And it's something which has not been properly addressed by an EU which is obsessed with big bang, high profile trade agreements like TTIP, which are actually the administrative equivalent of the dinosaur. This is 19th and 20th century stuff, and we need to be moving into the 21st century. Now, I can't deal with it in depth, but it is in Flexit. I've looked at eight particular issues, and there it is. You'll find the same graphic is in the Flexit document. And it looks at things such as transnational organized crime. And it's an interesting facet that we get the free trade zombies who, who, who prattle on about the brilliant... Uh, effects of free trade. 
and free trade agreements now, we must have free trade on this and free trade. The biggest beneficiaries of free trade are criminals. <laughs> the biggest growth industry globally is organised crime. And when you're developing systems which are being totally undermined by drug smuggling and by counterfeit trading and by all sorts of deception, then you find actually that if you add the downside to the upside on many of these free trade agreements, the net effect is a negative, not a positive. But people are not looking at it holistically. Britain can, on its own, provide the leadership which will kickstart the systems. And what you're seeing is forget these free trade deals. They are 19th century, 20th century stuff. Look at what's happening in the real world. Look at Eunice again, our old friend, and they are going in with OECD in Paris, looking hard at mechanisms of trade and administrative systems, and it's the administrative systems which slow down trade and cost the money. It's boring, techie stuff. But it's the difference between being able to get in a truck and drive from here to Belarus without stopping or being stopped four or five times and each time having to produce documents. So that you get this fascinating organisation, Nerd Speaks Again, Nerd shall speak unto Nerd. <laughs> <laughs> but we have WP6, look it up, it's on the internet, what they're doing is phenomenal. We talk about the Commission with its monopoly of a regulatory power, they're changing the model. They have international bodies and individual states getting together to define regulatory needs, free movers freely agreeing between parties of equals, not a bureaucratic nightmare sitting in Brussels dictating, but free agreement between equals of what is called an international model of regulation, worth looking at. They start off with this wonderful new animal, common regulatory objective. And it's agreed between democratic organisations, between NGOs and between companies who know what they need. Once you define the CRO, you then go out to international organisations and you decide which is the best one to work it out to settle it, and then you implement it through the TBT agreement. That is how the new world works, and we need to be part of it. We don't even know it exists, most of us. And when you say, what's the alternative to Brussels? That's it. It works, it's inexistent, we need to be part of it because Brussels is usurping it, and it is ours, not theirs. And that's what it looks like. That's an OECT chart, you can't read it, but it was just to give an indication of the mechanisms for improving free trade, and that is in addition to free trade agreements. And when you say, oh, China doesn't have a free trade agreement with the EU, maybe not, but it has a lot of these. And that's the point. Not everything is a free trade agreement, and very often it has much greater effect than something out of the 19th, 20th century rule book. Finally, we come to the Harrogate Agenda. And this doesn't necessarily happen afterwards. It can happen alongside everything else. But it's basically, do we trust the bastards? <laughs> if yes, sign here, I've got a bridge to sell you. If you haven't, then we've got to bring them in, reel them in, and tell them, that this country belongs to us. Do you know we assisted, after the Second World War, in writing the basic law for Germany, the Constitution, and it starts off by saying that the Germans are sovereign. That the individual members, the citizens of Germany, are sovereign. In Britain, we're not. Mm. We talk about parliamentary sovereignty. We don't get a look in. We have no sovereign rights. We are subjects. So we have to start by saying, hey, you know, forget it. It's ours. 
we want to assert our sovereignty. Let's go through very quickly because we've got very little time. We look at real democracy at local level. Democracy, I live in Bradford, ladies and gentlemen. My local authority has 460,000 people in it. And it calls itself a local authority? Come on! I spent a very enjoyable period over in, Swi uh, in, in Iceland recently. 134,000 and they got 54 local authorities. 134,000 people in the nation with 54 local authorities. And I go to Bradford and you've got 464 and 80,000 people and they call it a local authority? Come on! Can we have some democracy, please? Separation of powers. Purpose of Parliament at the moment is to provide a gene pool and a very shallow one for the Cabinet. You've got to separate this out. We've got to have proper MPs scrutinising the executive, not providing the raw cannon fodder. We need people's consent to laws. We need to see more referendums. Why should we sit with ignorant MPs deciding what laws we are when half the time they sit in their offices, the bell goes, they go downstairs and they go through the voting lobbies without even knowing what they're voting for? You complain about the European Parliament, but if you see it in Britain, it's a joke. Most of the time they have no idea. We need to be taking part. Then on item five, I love this. You'll be paying your tax bills, your, 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 your poll tax, no, council tax, they've now decided. Do you know there was a, a requirement that if we r raised uh, council tax by 2%, there had to be a referendum? My local council, and I think all your others, have gone up by about 4% this year. Where's the referendum? Oh, they've waived it because they wanted to raise it by 4%, so they've actually waived the requirement for a referendum. They've called it a levy, not an increase. Yeah, right, OK. Well, my view is, you want money, it's our money, you ask us, we'll tell you whether you can have it. In other words, you have a referendum on the budget. That'd be an interesting one, wouldn't it? And none of us are in a position to say what our constitution should be in the future, but I should say that we should need a national convention. We need to take a grip of what's happening to our country. We, the people, need to decide where we're going, and that's what that is about, item six. And over there is Neil, where he is. He, he is Mr. Harrogate Agenda, and he is going to bear the flag for us. But that, ladies and gentlemen, puts it together. We're nearly there, you'll be pleased to know, because that is Flexit. Flexible response, continuous development. In other words, leaving the EU is not an event, it is a process. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. <laughs>